It's summer here in New York City. Guess what I have been wearing on my face all summer long? Tizo. I love this sunscreen. I wear the Tizo 3 Tinted SPF 40. Doubles as a makeup primer. It's so great. And why is it called Tizo? Because it's mineral. The name is the minerals. Tizo stands for titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And these mineral sunscreens are the best choice for your skin. They're so good. 100% mineral sunscreen. I'm going to use three words together that you never hear. Silky mineral sunscreen. The <laughs> Tizo, you're actually going to look forward to putting this on every day. The formula blends so beautifully on all skin tones. The products are cruelty-free, they're ocean-safe, and they're free of parabens, gluten, fragrances, dyes, and phthalates. Love that. Go to tizoskin.com. I'm going to spell it for you. T-I-Z-O skin. You know how to spell skin. Tizoskin.com and use the code FATMASCARA15 for 15% off your entire order. Again, that's Tizoskin.com. Okay, everyone, this podcast is sponsored by Relief Band. You know, Jess and I love keeping everything we need in like our little makeup bag or our purse, oil blotting papers, lipstick. You know what you need to put in there this summer? Relief Band. It's the number one FDA approved anti-nausea wristband. And it's been clinically proven, you know I love that, clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea associated with motion sickness, even anxiety, migraines. You know how sometimes that can give you nausea, Mm -hmm. hangovers, all of these things that sort of tend to happen when the heat turns up in the summer and you want to have some fun. Relief bands are essential, especially for kind of like, I'm going to say it in, a gal on the go. I take the ferry to the city. I take the bus. I'm in traffic all the time. And relief bands really work. Honestly, I didn't know how they worked for a while, but they work. In case it's not clear, it's like the name says. Relief Band is legitimately a band you wear on your wrist and it gives you relief from nausea and uses technology that works with your body. It's safe, drug-free, zero side effects. It's really simple. So if you want to make uncomfortable nausea moments a thing of the past, check out Relief Band. Right now, we have an exclusive offer just for Fat Mascara listeners. If you go to reliefband.com and use the promo code Fat Mascara, you'll receive 20% off plus free shipping. So head to Relief Band, R-E-L-I-E-F, B-A-N-D, reliefband.com, and use our promo code Fat Mascara for 20% off plus free shipping. Hey everyone, welcome to Fat Mascara. I am Jen Sullivan. I'm Jess Matlin. How are you? How are you, everyone? How am I? I'm good. I'm excited it's Friday. Because I get to sit back and relax. No, just kidding. I do on this one, though, because I was not here for this interview. I get to live fresh. Like It's a fun, exciting, I'm a fly on a wall watching Jess Matlin do her thing. So this, is, in, this interview is one that I'm particularly psyched about because we've had an interview with Poppy King before. Poppy King, as you may remember, is the founder of Lipstick Queen. Now, Lipstick Queen was a major, major brand, still is major. Like, you can't take away Lipstick Queen from, like, everything it was, but she's no longer with Lipstick Queen. She founded Lipstick Queen long ago. She actually even had a brand when she was a teenager called Poppy. She's now moving into, like, her new era, which I can't wait to tell you about. But we had her on years and years ago, like, when we first started the podcast, and now we're going to talk about where she is now, but also what she thinks about the industry as a whole as it stands right now. Right now. She has some very strong opinions. She's never been one to mince words. She's always been really like one of the most progressive, forward thinking people in the industry. And she just marches to the beat of her own drum. So let's sit down with Poppy and hear where she is right now and what we can expect in the next few months. So let's take it away. Hi, Poppy. <laughs> Hi, Jess. <laughs> This is so nice to do this on a Friday with you. This is so great. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm I'm a little bit out of practice, sweetie, you know, because I've been in hiatus. It's okay. It's just a conversation. <laughs> okay, so let's get to it. So, Poppy, it has been so long. I'm very excited to have you back on the show because it's been years. 
I'm ready to introduce you to some listeners. Some of our listeners know who you are, and they're very excited that you're back on. They're fans of Lipstick Queen. They followed you. But some listeners might not know who you are. So I'm going to try to be concise with my introductions. It's very difficult for me. It's a weakness. But what I'm going to try to say, this is like my new test for myself. How would I introduce you to a friend? So I would say, I would literally say, hi, this is my friend Poppy. And I would say, she is the lipstick queen. She is the queen of lipstick. How would you introduce yourself to a friend? That's interesting. I mean, I, it, I when I named my, Lipstick Queen was my second brand. My first brand was called Poppy. That was the one that I had in Australia. Yes, yes, yes. And it was interesting because I saw Lipstick Queen as a sort of broad term that there are so many of us that could be quote unquote lipstick queens in terms of devoted to lipstick. So it's so funny because people people then started calling me the Lipstick Queen, which was which which is kind of interesting because it was more it was more about all of us being potential lipstick queens. But I guess the way that I introduce myself and it always gets such a wide-eyed response it actually happened to me yesterday when someone asked me what I did, and I said, I'm a lipstick designer. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. A lipstick yeah, designer. A, a lipstick designer. And I tell you, yeah, it's a it's a real it's a real conversation starter. You know, it's funny that you said that, like there are so many lipstick queens. I did think about that. I was like, you are a the lipstick queen, because that is like you are one of the few, and we'll talk about this more. You are one of the few, if not the only people in beauty who centered completely on lipstick. But then I thought, oh, well, like Bobby Brown did start out with just the lipsticks, but then she expanded. And I think about other artists who are like, Lisa Eldred started out with just the lipsticks, but these are people who were very close to just lipsticks, but you stayed with just lipstick. You know what I mean? Like, and I think of you, your book, Confessions of a Lipstick Queen. Like you, you really are synonymous with lipsticks. You're always wearing a lipstick, you lead with the lips. For me, I am actually at this point, I can say the only person in the industry, even even in the history of the industry, that has focused entirely for sort of 30 years yeah. on lipstick. And it's because of my, I mean, we'll get into this more, but it's because of my belief that lipstick really is a mind altering substance in a good way. And it's just endlessly fascinating to me. Tell me, well, tell me more about that. Like you were searching for lipstick your whole life, right? Like you were, that's always been, it's almost like an extension of yourself. Well, it really started just when I was seven, actually. And so a long, you know, and I think that's a lot of time when a lot of people, a lot of kids will start with dress ups. And for me, I kind of like was realizing the power of playing dress ups and getting dressed up in my mum's clothes. But it was when I first put on lipstick that I had this kind of incredible experience with it that I wasn't expecting, which is it didn't just change me on the outside. What was more fascinating to me as a little girl was it made me feel different on the inside. I guess that word is confidence, but you don't know that at seven. And for me, seven was a difficult age for me. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs actually, if you peel back the beginnings of their entrepreneurship, it can often come from difficult times, not necessarily from that sort of light bulb, it can actually come more from a space of real personal search. And I think in my case, I was reading fairy tales, you know, as you do at seven. And even in Australia, we we're very inundated with Disney's idea of fairy tales. And because of my, I, I recognised very early that I kind of had because I have a prominent nose and, and curly hair that I, but then I also have big eyes and big lips, you know, that I had both features of both a witch and a princess. And I think for me, it was really difficult as a little girl to sort of think, okay, well, what am I? Am I a witch or am I a princess? And it was really when I found lipstick and put lipstick on that I kind of realized I don't have to be either. Right. I never knew that story. And that's, that's quite painful to think about a little girl. Not quite painful. It's very painful to think about a little girl even having a question mark in her head. Is she a witch or a princess? I think it's actually much, much more common. I think it's really because when you look at fairy tales, which is really usually where a lot of girls and I'm sure little boys too get their ideas of beauty standards from first before you know before anything else. And for me, it was just so clear when I looked in the mirror 
that kind of my features could go either way. And I guess for me, when I put on lipstick, I realised that there was a third way that I didn't have to choose. And that was a way of being a sort of empowered woman on the inside, regardless of what the standards were on the outside. The fairy tale thing is very interesting. Did you ever share that with anyone who is in a place of power at Disney or anything? Well, I actually did have some, did do some, well, I, I, I ended up not doing it because I didn't agree with them. But Disney did approach me to do something, but not about that. I'm only really starting to share, Jess, the, the, this sort of true sort of early beginnings and at this point in my life at 51 I think for me the story was always and and it's true was that I couldn't find a matte lipstick in 1990 in Australia I could only find shiny glittery lipsticks and that's kind of where the search started but really during the pandemic which I know we're going to talk about I had so much time <laughs> because masks came in so lipsticks were not exactly a necessary topic at the time I had so much time to really really think about really where did the search begin and yes the search began when I was 17 and I realized that I had a vintage kind of look and I was going to lean into it rather than fight against it and I couldn't find any 1940s style lipsticks I only found sort of pink shimmery lipsticks that looked great on all my friends but me with a sort of more of an old-fashioned look it looked terrible but it's really during the pandemic when I think we all sort of had that time to really reflect back on all the choices we'd made in our life that I really started to realise that it really was that time of sort of trying to come to terms with whether the world was going to see me as a witch or whether they were going to see me as a princess that sort of led to my fascination with, with lipstick. And I have had the chance, I can't tell you what brand, but I had a meeting with 18 heads of departments of a major brand about two months ago and I was telling this story and one of the women interrupted me and said, oh, my God, you have to write a children's book, The Witch Princess. So I am starting to say it really to, to talk about it more because I think it is something that is so, so influential in the early beginnings of our ideas of being female, that division between witch or princess. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the story that you're telling me is one that I haven't heard, and maybe you have shared it with other media, but I haven't heard that. No, you're the first. <laughs> you're the first. Wow, I feel very happy about this. No, I because I think that's far more compelling than, you know, I've heard the story about the matte lipstick and all that, and that's nice, but it's not nearly as compelling as what you're sharing. And maybe it's because I have a daughter. Maybe it's because I've always, who's watching all of that. And my daughter goes like, she'll watch, you know, it's amazing how, you know, Cinderella, my husband, I always tell her like, Cinderella came out before my parents were born or Jeff's parents. Like this is old. And, you know, this is still resonating with a three-year-old girl. She's watching it and she'll point to go like, she's bad. And we're not telling her she's bad, but like, she knows she's bad or there was Snow White. She's watching Snow White. It's What is that, from like the 30s? She goes, and she's bad. She knows she's bad because why? Because she looks, well, I mean, she like gave a the, witch. She well, gave yeah. a hunter a knife. So, you know, but, yeah, but yeah, but yeah it, it's, it's kind of incredible. And also another thing too, you know, when, when you really, because I have always been fascinated with transformation and you know and fairy tales are always stories about transformation and it's really in, and, and one of the things that I really wish more little girls and little boys knew is that in the original Grimm's fairy tale version of Cinderella which is pretty macabre you know, <laughs> but forgetting that the ugly stepsisters were actually beautiful on the outside the ugly it was only Disney ah. that made them ugly quote unquote ugly on the out on the outside in 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 the original Grimm's fairy tales what made the ugly stepsisters ugly was their personalities not their look why would disney change that disney has been one of the biggest perpetrators of standardized of standardized beauty and in terms of binary ideas of beauty and so a lot of what disney has done with Grimm's fairy tales or with Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales is really very much about standardizing beauty. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, that's uh, 
the, the Grimm's fairy tales were yeah, definitely a, a little bit uh, different than Disney. So let's rewind a little bit. And when you left Lipstick Queen, what happened there? Can, can give give us give us the story in a nutshell, Poppy? Because <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure it was complicated as these things usually well, are. It actually wasn't, you know. Oh, in, okay. In the sense that really, I had found myself in the position that a lot of beauty founders find themselves where they no longer own the company because they've had to take in investors or owners in order to fund growth. And really why I left was I really didn't believe anymore in the growth strategy that was being suggested uh, as the growth strategy for Lipstick Queen, and which was about filling it with a lot more product in order to gain more sort of real estate in our retailers. Right. And that's just not the way that I want to conduct my creativity is by filling, is just to fill gondolas at Sephora or Ulta. And so I really came to the decision that that I wanted to leave and continue to do my narrow and deep focus on lipstick rather than, you know, fulfil a growth plan just with any products to sort of make, make, make a sales number happen. And so it was pretty simple. It was really just it didn't reflect my values anymore. Would that be something like instead of just lipstick, we're going to do brow products or would it just be a bigger world of lipstick? I mean, it was really more when things started to, like the hero skews of lipstick, meaning the hero products the one, of Lipstick Queen that really carried it, were all these amazing single lipsticks that I developed. Hello Sailor, Medieval. Frog, Frog Prince. Prince. Yes, you know, you know, and it was when there was the pressure to start what they call flankers or franchising that and starting ah. to do, you know, the pressure to, well, Frog, this one's been such a hit, let's do a blush in it, let's do a this in it. Mm-hmm. And that's just not, that's not how I create and it's not how I converse with the customer. I mean, so in terms of like just trying to sort of make them buy more of something, I'd rather sort of inspire them to buy something new and next rather than just sort of buy more of what is already working. That makes perfect sense to me. Okay. So you left Lipstick Queen. And can I, sorry, Jess, can I say leaving Lipstick Queen was, and I, I mean, I might even tear up now, but was one of the hardest decisions I've ever made. It was really, it, that was not a decision that came easily. It really was a decision that I really had to put my values first. How long did you wrangle with it for? Probably about two years because when you started something from the ground up, literally you've been the one sort of in the warehouse doing, packing this, doing that, and you've seen it build to a multi-million dollar company, it really does feel at that point like a limb, like an arm or a leg or something like that. And leaving it felt very much like I was leaving a part of me behind. And it definitely will always be, I mean, Lipstick Queen now is owned by a private equity company, but it, I'll always have an umbilical cord to that. I will always love that brand because it, it came out of me. Yeah, I'd imagine that felt really sad. It was sad, but also it was really one of those, it was a situation that really made me understand that the same reasons, naive as they may be, that I, went, that I started my first lipstick company at 18, are the same reasons at 51, and that is that I'm not here to do what everybody else is doing. I'm here to do something that is so unique in its focus and in its storytelling. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's that's hard. That's really hard. Was there like a, was there an aha moment where you were like, I know this is the time. Yeah, yeah, I can visualize it right. Yeah, exactly. Like a, like a sort of like a last straw or something like that, or. There was a last straw when I was told who I would be reporting to and the background of this person was from a corporation that I know very well and I just knew that if I had to report to that mentality, I couldn't do it. So I I left. I'm glad that you were able to stick to your values and that's really um, 
That's really admirable. Thank you. It's something that wasn't easy because, uh, you know, 20, I, in 2018 was really when I went to get started again. And then we all know what happened in 2020. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's not been easy to follow along with your journey so much because you are one of the few entrepreneurs, big beauty, big beauty entrepreneurs who isn't shouting about their every big business move on, <laughs> on, on Instagram. That sounded way snarkier than I meant it to. I just mean you don't have a big Instagram profile and that's been really intentional. From you. It has been very intentional and, and, and I say this without judgment. I really mean it without judgment on any on anybody else around it. But for me personally, and that was another reason why I sort of also wanted to move away from Lipstick Queen because I could see that I, the growth strategy was going to, to force me into having to do all of the, the, the TikTok videos, the this, the that, all that kind well, of stuff. Absolutely. And I, and I mean that like if you are, have a public profile, if you're a beauty or a, any kind of big consumer business and you're the face of the business, you have to be out there like cutting a ribbon or shaking hands, wearing the product, like it's part and parcel of the game. It is. But for me, I just am, I really believe on a psychological level that social media is not a constructive medium. Of course, there can be bits and pieces of it that are, but I just immediately felt that it's not something, to, again, talking about my values, that fits with my values in terms of my whole reason for being is authenticity. And it's very hard, and, I, and, and, I, and I'll even put this on myself, it's very hard to be authentic on social media. Even if you set out to be, there's something drags you or drags me away from a kind of authenticity. And then I also don't want to commodify my authenticity. You know, I see... I mean, I'm very happy to see people like Paulina Postorofikova and stuff like that who are sort of talking about their flaws and, you know, age. Um, but it's just not, for me, it's not something, it's not a medium that I really believe in in a long-term way. I think I said to you before that I feel like social media is kind of the smoking of our generation that will sort of look back and realise how bad it is for you to have just constant images coming at you. And I just didn't want to be part of that visual pollution. Visual pollution. I love that. And also, Jess, I genuinely believe, and again, this is me at 17 and at 51 is the same thing, that when you have a really, really wonderful product, and when I, what I think of as a wonderful product is something simple, something true, something consistent, and something with a point of view, right? When you have, so let's take frog prints, for example. The person, the founder, doesn't have to be on there hawking it. The, it's almost like the, the product should do it itself. Like I feel that the challenge with social media is not for me to be on promoting myself. but to A thousand percent. Up, but to come up with things that are so contagious and inspiring that they promote themselves rather than me promoting me. Well, it's like you see, um, I can think of all these fashion brands. Like you don't necessarily see the designer out there on TikTok acting a fool. I've never been on TikTok, not once. I've never seen a TikTok video. <laughs> I mean, like Don't really. Start. <laughs> but yeah, it's like there's, so I asked this question. So if you listen to Fat Mascara regularly, you will know that about a month or two ago, we had the amazing Leslie Hall on. Leslie Hall is like the last word in paid social for beauty. She is the founder of Ice to Media. And we had, we recorded with her for a long time and we had to cut some of the questions out because just for, so that you weren't listening to an hour and a half podcast, because mm -hmm. I know that that doesn't really land. But one of the questions that we cut out was a question I asked that I thought was like really clever and I felt like it landed like a lead balloon. But the question that I asked was, <laughs> I was like, Leslie, do you think that a brand today could succeed being, I think we cut this out. Hopefully we cut this out and you guys aren't going to be like, oh, you left that in and you sounded like a fool. But I was like, Leslie, do you think a brand could succeed with out being on social media today could not answered me could not have answered me any quicker 
She goes, no. And I just, I felt like she was looking at me like, what kind of question is that? (laughs) And I said, well, I had just come from this conference and it was like a luxury beauty conference like the week before. And I was on this panel and I was talking about Moda, our consumer and how they shop. And the guy next to me, and I was talking about the importance of social. And the guy next to me was saying how many like super, you know, super ultra high net worths like are not even on social. Now I know this is like a confluent, like these are different topics that we're all talking about once, but he was saying how like the most elite thing right now is just to not even be on social. And that is like the ultimate aspiration is like for an individual to not even be on social. But then I'm thinking, well, what if you apply that to a brand? Forget about the income and everything, but just like not even being on social. I was like, oh yeah, that must be really, that's super cool. And Leslie was like, mm, your thinking doesn't track here. Like a brand has to be searchable on social. And I was like, oh. I disagree. <laughs> I thought I thought this was a cool theory and it was like, no, well, no, I <laughs> no, Jess. <laughs> no, I, right, I think you're right on for asking that question. But a lot of people are economically dependent on the idea that you have well, to be social. I, I thought it was like the, you know, like in, when you go to like to a cool like speakeasy mm-hmm. and it's like, you know, you got to know someone who knows someone. You go, I mean, I don't do this anymore because I'm at home with my child, but like, it's like, Here's the password. You got to go through the hot dog place. I think, yes, it's possible for a brand not to be on social media, but but the products need to be on social media. So what I'm saying is there's a distinction distinction between the the brand pushing itself on social media versus people actually spontaneously using the product. So I think you do need your products on social media, but I don't believe in being, I mean, I, I, I feel, I personally feel really shocked when I see brands like Chanel or whatever, if I'm scrolling through Instagram, whatever, and you see, it, 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 it see Chanel and the next thing you see is something about the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. And, you know, it's just, it's so, it's just such a sort of, river of information that I don't believe is a brand to be on social media, but I believe having products that people want to use and will use them on social media. So I see that as a distinction. Mm, I get you. It's a very challenging thing to navigate. And I think visual pollution and the analogy made with smoking is absolutely perfect. Well, I think what's going to happen with social, you know, and I've, I've, I've done the same business in two different centuries, right? So I started my first lipstick business in 1992, right? So in my yeah. niche, so that's a whole different century. And then I started my second lipstick business, Lipstick Clean, in the 21st century. So I've done the same business with and without social media. And what I really think is going to happen is I do think that there's going to be more and more evidence that this constant flow of random imagery coming at us is really not good for the nervous system. And I really do genuinely believe, and I may be the only person in New York City, but I do believe that ultimately social media will become something that only sort of diehard users use and a lot of people will actually move away from, not a little bit like smoking. Okay, you've heard us talk about hemp here at Fat Mascara. We love their body lotions. Well, guess what? All your favorite scents of hemp now come in scrubs and body washes. They're all plant-based, vegan, and cruelty-free. And yes, there's a fragrance-free option for those of you who want that. But I am loving the scrub right now. I am, first of all, not gloopy doopy. You know how we hate a gloopy (laughs) scrub. Hate it. Hemp's Original Herbal Sugar Scrub. The texture on this is so good. And the scent, oh, take me away. I want to be taken away by hemp's. They have an incredible wash with three-in-one formulas. You know I'm a girl on the go. You can exfoliate with glycolic acid. You're going to clean while it's going to moisturize you at the same time. And it hydrates you with that 100% natural hemp seed oil. Also has shea butter. Jen and I have been like talking about shea butter basically since we were born. And aloe vera. And can I tell you about the scents? Please do. (gasps) Sweet pineapple and honey melon. Triple moisture, which is like a really nice scent original herbal, pomegranate herbal, 
I mean, these are like popsicle flavors. I love it. It's a tropical delight. Elevate your shower routine with Hemp's new body washes and scrubs. They're available at Ulta Beauty and Hemp's.com. That's Hemp's H-E-M-P-Z with a Z. Make sure to check it out today. Hey everyone, this podcast is brought to you by Cash App. With tools for saving, sending, and spending, it's the all-in-one place for you to glow up your money and glow up your life. I glow up my money with Cash App, but I also had a personal glow up. I don't know if you remember this. It was about, I would say, 10 years ago now. I was just another brunette in New York doing my thing. And I said, it's time to let my white hair streak grow in. I thought it would give me a little differentiation, make me stand out from the crowd. So I grew in my white hair and it was as glowy, right? Like, come on, you thought it was a glow up for me, right? Yeah, I mean, you went from like being like just another brunette on the street, nameless and faceless. <laughs> to like a superhero. To Jen. No, to I Jen. I'm telling Edit. you, I yeah. walk down the street now, all the time people yell to me like, what's up, Rogue? Like from the, you know, X-Men. Yep. What's up, you Storm? I feel like much more myself. I feel like I have a little bit of a superhero power. Yeah. And that is like kind of what Cash App does for your money. So if you want to glow up your life, you got to glow up your money. Download Cash App in the App Store or Google Play. There's no hidden fees and a free-to-order debit card. It feels like a makeover for your finances. Okay, everyone. We're talking about our moves, my favorite. It's summer. It's busy. We've got work. We've got weekend stuff. We've got little trips. But you know what we always have time for? A bite-sized workout from Allo Moves. It's the streaming on-demand wellness platform that features yoga practices, fitness routines, meditation sessions. For me personally, Jess, it features hip opening. This is my discovery this summer. There's so many great instructors, truly. Everybody on this platform knows what they're talking about. But I found this 15-minute class called Smarter Hips by Hiro Landazori. I have been loving this. I feel like we sit in a chair a lot. I don't know what it is lately, but like I just need to like... I picture butterfly. My pelvic bones are butterflies opening up. Hero gets me there. And all of that in just 15 minutes with aloe moves. It's so good. And it's not only fitness and yoga. There's also gua sha, facial yoga, meditation, all these things you wish you had time to learn how to do. Aloe moves can do that for you. I want to do butterfly right now. Just like the thought of it sounds delicious. Before I open my hips, I want you to make time for your wellness goals with Allo Moves. For a limited time, Allo Moves is offering our listeners a free 30-day trial. Plus, get this, 50% off an annual membership. But you can only get it by going to allomoves.com and using the code MASCARA in all caps. Okay, all caps. That's A-L-O moves.com and all caps code MASCARA to get your free 30-day trial plus 50% off an annual membership. Allomoves.com code MASCARA in all caps. Okay, you've talked about followers. That word offends you, right? Well, I guess I've just never wanted to be an influencer or have followers. I think the whole thing with social media for me, the moment it came out, I mean, I remember a friend of mine showing me Facebook like back in 2002 and seeing all the language around it. Like if you remember back to then, you could poke someone. Remember? Oh, you- my God. Oh, yeah, that always grossed me out. Yeah. <laughs> but, so I just think all the language around it for me is off-putting. I don't really want to have followers. I, I would like to have sort of like-minded fellows but not but 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 not followers and I think during the pandemic I really had to sort of as I was starting to think about doing my next brand which is coming out here as as you know Jess I've got a new brand coming that really kind of what it was that how I was going to what it was that I was trying to do and it's really I don't mark it around aspiration. I mark it around imagination and it's a different tone and it's a different frequency and that's something that kind of will always make me different to any brand that's sort of on social media or anybody or an influencer. I mean, I just don't believe for me that an influencer is what I want to be. Explain that difference between 
imagination and aspiration. So aspiration is kind of when the trigger to buy is you're aspiring to be like somebody else. You're aspiring to some lifestyle or aspiring to to something outside of yourself. Where for me, imagination, when, when I design a lipstick with imagination instead of like an aspiration to be like me or somebody else, that it's about the internal. It's about it's about sparking something on the inside, whereas aspiration is on the outside. And I'm always about going back internal. I mean, I really do believe that beauty is true beauty is an internal experience more so than it is anything else. Well, I am in complete agreement. And while Jen isn't here, I know she feels the same because that's what <laughs> we're always about at Fat Mascara. People always think like Fat Mascara, if, we're, if, we don't, if they don't know what we do and we're explaining, but somebody who's not necessarily a beauty person, they're like, oh, well, do you do tutorials or you <laughs> teach people to how, put on lipstick? I'm like, oh my, no, no, that's not no, that's, what, no. Oh I was God. out with friends last night and I was saying that I was doing this today and I was saying like, it's just such a refreshing podcast this way oh, <laughs> you know, for, that, for that reason. And again, I mean, I do want to emphasize, I'm not judging anybody else for how they're conducting themselves it's just kind of having to come to terms with people say if you can't beat them join them it's just like I can't join them yeah (laughs) that's all I can do I share that so you're going to be doing this new brand which comes out around the fall right September October ish okay amazing I will keep everybody posted on that this is a new brand but you're entering okay now you said you have a brand that's coming out not only in your second century of doing this but you're facing some new challenges or you're being a little bit I feel my sense is you're far more vocal and much more honest, if you've always been honest, but I feel like you're much more vocal about the things that are pissing you off (laughs) as you are launching a new brand. What challenges are you speaking up more about? So really, I mean, because in the 30 years, I mean, I've been, I've, I've consulted to companies like Kate Spade. I've done a collaboration with J Crew. I did some work with Disney. I've been on QVC. I was embedded at Estee Lauder Corporation as a vice president there. I've seen so many, such a sort of 360 degree view of indie brands, big corporate, all of these different aspects. And I've always wanted to do beauty differently in terms of doing it without a focus on growth being the main metric for success. And one of the things that I'm really starting to be more vocal on, because I believe it impacts the climate and impacts the environment, is that the level that the idea of growth in beauty needs to be rethought and the idea that the that growth is the key metric means that just more and more product is being put out that isn't necessarily being requested through a demand it's the supply creating the supply and then trying to rustle up a demand and so for me as i see the changes happening in the climate and as i see more and more of the yeah i'm raising my hand cuz i'm i'm laughing because when you said that nobody's nobody is like the demand isn't there it's not there it's just not there don't you okay i know you're not a big social person mm-hmm. but Anytime a new line that's like really dumb comes out or some stupid, <laughs> I was like some dumb or some stupid or a celebrity line comes out that is random or just like foolish, there's always like a comment that comes up right underneath, like an Instagram comment or like TikTok and it's like, nobody asked for this. <laughs> like it's like, that's like a cliche, like a, you know, or like a meme kind of exactly caption exactly and it's like they're being factual nobody asked for this like the public did not want this or Jen and I always talk about we're not in magazines anymore because like very few people are now just because of the declining state but when we started versus when we left the amount of mailings went from let's say I'll call it just for fun, 10 bags a day to 25 bags a day. Oh, that's messenger, like, you know, mailings. Mm -hmm. But yet the ad pages declined exponentially. 
the opportunities for placements for these products and the amount of staff that like, it's like, wait, I don't understand. Why are you sending more things when there's no opportunity to talk about these things? It didn't make sense. Make it, make it make sense. Like, I don't get it. And it still doesn't actually make sense in terms of that there's, there's actually, I think you could, there are fewer celebrities who don't have beauty brands mm-hmm. than celebrities mm-hmm. that do. And I think part of the sort of culprit for that total sort of tsunami of product that's happened to us in the beauty industry is because of social media and because of the people behind these celebrity brands, which is usually men and it's usually finance men and, you know, think, are assuming that if you have X thousands of followers that you can have X thousands of customers, but it's a follower and a customer are two very different things. And so what we've got is this deluge of product because they're assuming that there's a certain level of, of followers. But a follower is very different to a customer. A customer really needs to connect with the product, not just follow it. And how many how many of them are repeat buyers of the celebrity beauty brands? Well, that's why my business model has always been and will continue to be now that I'm going back out there again, is like really doing one lipstick at a time so that I'm not having to sort of press go on hundreds of thousands of units of single-use plastic. I really feel as an entrepreneur a huge responsibility that if I'm green lighting a product about the plastic that's being used. Unfortunately, with the way that the manufacturing is at the moment, it's very hard to do anything on a small scale. But during the pandemic, which I basically went into my own beauty invention lab, I've really started to think about how can the beauty industry start delivering product without single-use plastic? And there is ways to do it. It's not just refills. It's about the whole methodology of how the product gets onto your face. That makes that makes perfect sense. And I feel like you're one of the rare entrepreneurs who was willing to talk about this problem. Oh, I, I actually would like, I'm, and I and I will be agitating as I get more <laughs> out there. I, I, I actually believe that that in order to reduce the single use plastic problem, that there's a metric straight away that could help it, and that was would be if all the beauty companies had a treaty that they were no longer going to report quarterly growth. Because when you report quarterly growth, that means every three months you're reporting your sales and what bumps up sales is pushing in new products. So if the gro- if we weren't reporting, if be- there are a lot of, there are some industries that need to report quarterly and there are some industries that do not need to report quarterly and one of those is beauty and if beauty entered into a treaty of not reporting quad- quarterly anymore, I can tell you, Jess, the amount of single-use plastic that would not be forced upon this earth would change drastically. <sighs> this is like... Sorry, I'm just reflecting. It's very depressing. It's depressing, but I also think, you know, it's... I have actually have a lot of hope, and I'll tell you why. I am on the board of a beautiful garden here in uh, New York City, the Elizabeth Street Garden, and uh, which we're trying to save from, from the city taking back. Anyway, as a result, so I've been working in that garden for 10 years, and I have had so much interaction with what's named Gen Z that I can see that the Gen Z really isn't going to, I think the way in which beauty corporations are still clinging to is just not going to fly for too much longer. I think there's going to be massive change and we're going to enter a post-hierarchy beauty era where it's just completely based on different things because of the values of Gen Z, who are well aware of the fact that they need air and water and four seasons a year in order to reach adulthood. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. It's going to get so much better. I think there's a revolution coming. I really do. You know what? My friend is convinced. I'm saying my friend as if but between you and my friend, it is written. The revolution is coming. But he is so convinced. I hope he's listening. But he went on a whole tirade the other day about he really he really feels that we're going to hit a tipping point between everything that's just happening in the world. I was like, you know what? I hope you're right. 
Absolutely. I think there's a new enlightenment coming. Uh, you know, I, I really do think that. And, I'm, and I really genuine, genuinely believe that the beauty business and the beauty industry, the industry that surrounds it, is headed for a huge reckoning. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, it, the, yeah, the, the amount of waste is getting crazy. We, we try to be thoughtful here on FM, but yeah, it's, it's a bigger problem. Okay. We, we've got to wrap up soon and you, I could just talk to you all day. I'd love to know you've had so many amazing s- successes over the years. We've talked about Poppy, Lipstick Queen, so much critical acclaim and commercial success, but I want to know in the future overall, what does success look like to you? Well, I think no one's going to be surprised with this answer. I mean, success to me is really about the freedom to live your values. And I think that for me that it's not a financial, I mean, the financial side comes into it because obviously you, you want know, to live. <laughs> you want to live. But the but success just for me is is being able to to live and work and maintain myself as a single woman as close to my values as possible. Incredible. And can you give our listeners a great piece of advice? Maybe it's something you learned the hard way. Maybe it's something that one of your incredible mentors gave you. You have some very high profile mentors in this beauty world. Mm-hmm. I've been very lucky with the people that have come into my life on, on the highest level. And I think one of the things that I think really stands out to me in terms of advice is actually something that I learned in my last year of high school and it was and I didn't really pay much attention in high school uh, you know <laughs> I was more like a, a distraction in between the weekends <laughs> but I remember we were doing a particular media studies course this is back in Australia in the 80s and the teacher told us this saying that when a dog bites a man, that's not news. But when a man bites a dog, that's news. And for me, what I loved about that, and I've pretty much lived my life with that, is understanding that it's being unusual, although it's not an easy path, but really the, my advice is be original, be unusual, don't do what everybody else is doing, and that's really what leads to success. Wow. That's great. You've definitely bitten the man a few times. <laughs> okay. And why don't you tell us some of your favorite products that you're loving right now? Are you wearing your new lipstick? I am. Not not the first one that's coming out. This is this is the second one coming oh, out. Oh, okay. We're already on to the second one. Okay. I absolutely adore, and you tell me if I'm saying the name um, properly, Walida, W. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I love that brand. Like, I worship it. I think it's absolutely wonderful jewel of a brand that I actually tried to convince a very big corporation to look into to doing something with it because I absolutely adore that brand and because it's all flower-based, so obviously I have. And I think the packaging is beautiful. It's so it's so humble and quiet and such a beautiful... It's a great word, humble. It's a humble brand. It is a humble brand. And then the other thing is I've discovered, I've really discovered Revlon Mascara. You know, Maybelline is always thought of as the mascara, mm-hmm. you know, the mass mascara benchmark but I have to say there's a Revlon mascara called Eyes Wide Open that I don't know that one oh my god it's amazing I mean I've really it's the before and after on it is incredible Eyes Wide Open and I love that that so I've got to say Revlon mascaras are really not given enough credit I love that everyone Head to your drugstore and try a Revlon mascara. I'm rooting for Revlon. I feel like I'm always like, come on. It's such a great brand. Revlon, there will never, ever be a brand that has had so much influence on the idea of the American woman as Revlon ever again. All right. And then we're going to wrap up with a quick lightning round FM5. All right. Nothing to prepare for. Just easy breezy. Okay. <laughs> it's like easy breezy, beautiful. Another, uh, another one. All right. <laughs> First beauty product you fell in love with? Need specifics. Bieber lipstick in what was called ox blood. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a fairly sophisticated product. But yeah, Bieber lipstick. Pet peeve. My pet peeve is when I'm told something can't be done 
and when you really drill down on it, it's just a bit that it maybe it hasn't been done, but people will put it as it can't be done when actually it just maybe hasn't been done. <laughs> but it's like annoying to do. <laughs> okay, it's 12 noon on a Saturday. What are you most likely doing? Painting. I've started painting in all my lipsticks. So all of the inventory that I had after my wonderful Barney's closed, I decided to repurpose into an art show, which I will be doing a big show coming. So I paint. I paint on canvas with the lipsticks and I sculpt in lipstick. I've been using all my inventory to turn it into art. Beautiful. What is the movie you can watch again and again? Cabaret. (laughs) Oh, so good. I absolutely love Cabaret. And what's so funny about Cabaret is it's like a tale of two cities in the sense that so many people who see that film just see it as a story of a sort of tragic diva. But really, actually, the underlying story is about the beginnings of the Second World War and that sort of, and, and and the incredible, incredible Weimar era. That was cabaret, which I think we can I think we can learn so much from now. And then your idea of happiness. Kitty cats. I just have to say, <laughs> I know that there's that there's you know anybody any middle aged woman is scared to admit that <laughs> because of the stigma, but I really I mean and animals. I have actually realised that. I cannot be happy if I'm not sharing my life with something with four legs. Let's banish the stigma. There's no (laughs) stigma. (laughs) Embrace life with animals. It is so messed up. I said that we're going to make it quick. No, it is so messed up that one must qualify or apologize for a life with animals. They make life good. They absolutely do, and I don't see I don't see it as substitute love. I see it as a as a whole different love in itself. It's sublime. I love it. What's your cat's name? I've got two. One is called Nova. That's the boy, and he was from a shelter. He was called Casanova in the shelter ah, because he's like, a real Casanova. Yeah. But I call him Nova, and I've got another little girl called T. Oh, enjoy them. I so do. lucky of two. I'll keep campaigning, Poppy. Thank you so much. This was so awesome. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much, Jess, for for giving me a chance to to speak with such realness about both my story and what I see as the future. Oh, if only. Let's hope. Let's hope. Here's to the revolution. (laughs) Viva la revolution. It'll happen. It'll happen. Thank you so much, Poppy. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the show. It's your reviews and feedback that help us make the podcast even better. Head over to iTunes to rate and review us or email your thoughts to info at fatmascara.com. We also want to answer your beauty questions and hear what products you love. To share a Razor One product review or to ask a beauty question, email us at info at fatmascara. If you send it as a voice memo file, we can even share your voice on the podcast. You can also do that by leaving us a voice message. Our phone number in the United States is 646-481-8182. Thanks so much for listening. It's summer here in New York City. Guess what I have been wearing on my face all summer long? Tizo. I love this sunscreen. I wear the Tizo 3 tinted SPF 40. Doubles as a makeup primer. It's so great. And why is it called Tizo? Because it's mineral. The name is the minerals. Tizo stands for titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And these mineral sunscreens are the best choice for your skin. They're so good. 100% mineral sunscreen. I'm going to use three words together that you never hear. Silky, mineral sunscreen. The Tizo, (laughs) you're actually going to look forward to putting this on every day. The formula blends so beautifully on all skin tones. The products are cruelty-free, they're ocean-safe, and they're free of parabens, gluten, fragrances, dyes, and phthalates. Love that. Go to tizoskin.com. I'm going to spell it for you. T-I-Z-O skin. You know how to spell skin. Tizoskin.com and use the code FATMASCARA15 for 15% off your entire order. Again, that's tizoskin.com.